Okay, welcome everybody to another episode of the Crew Philosopher Podcast. I am your host, the Crew Philosopher here. I'm joined today by Wilford Riley. Uh, now, I didn't tell Will this before, but um, I use ChatGPT to kind of ask, I say, hey, do you know who Wilford Riley is? <laughs> the new Ch- the new ChatGPT 4.0. And this is what it, it gave me. It said, Wilford Riley is an American political scientist and associate professor at uh, Kentucky State University. He is known for his research on race relations, hate crimes, and political bias. Riley has written several books, including Hate Crime Hoax, How the Left is Selling a Fake Race War, and Taboo, 10 Facts You Can't Talk About. His work often challenges mainstream narratives and emphasizes the importance of empirical evidence in discussing social and political issues. Wolf Riley, welcome to the podcast. Was that a fair description of who you are? Yeah, I think so. It sounds like, I mean, so a lot of people talk like these chat bots are going to kill us all, like they're <laughs> going to develop consciousness on some alien bug shit and come for mankind. No, um, they're basically just glorified versions of what I do with Stata. They're kind of fill in the blank spell checkers. Um, so it sounds like they just went to my Wikipedia page and then they went to Google and they got the like the internal pages of my books and they put all that together. So, yeah, no, that's exactly who I am. I'm a Kentucky State assistant pro- associate prof now. And, yeah, those are those are the titles I've written and so on. So, yeah, good to, it's good to see chat GPT doing its work. <laughs> that's exactly what I did after that. Uh, um, I got that little synopsis. I said, let me see what it says on um, when I Google your name. And yeah. Wikipedia had that first chunk, and then the rest it just pieced together from here to there. Now, I do think, though, because this is the beginning of it. AI is kind of still like a baby, though, right? Like, I'm upset that I live in 2024 because I'm going to die before the good shit comes. Because I think 20... The, the year 3000, assuming human beings don't blow ourselves up, I think it is going to be a good time. I think that, I mean, so like the the AI stuff, I don't think AI can become sapient. Like, I think that there are things in society that people get used to assuming because smart people have said them before. So like if you read sci-fi, like the aliens always look like another predator species that humans fought before. Like they look (laughs) like big cats or they look like giant reptiles from the edges of race memory or something like that. Sometimes they're bugs, which we never came into conflict with, but which, you know, we see when we get down on our knees and all that. The reality is that there's no reason to assume that an alien species would look like anything on Earth at all. Like, it would be alien. Like, we have no idea what something from a world with a methane atmosphere and 10 times earthly gravity would look like. I mean, it could easily, given those two presets, not to walk out too much about this, but it'd probably be like a lead-based organism. We probably wouldn't know it was alive based on how slow it might move and so on. So anyway, but like the, that's just an, one example of a preset. Another one is that like in all the sci-fi books, like the robots come to life. They discover love. I think it was Heinlein called this a click, like the machine clicked to life. There's no reason to assume that would happen. Like we know how to program a computer so that when a computer processes data for the first time, e- e- the mathematical program is programmed to recognize errors that were initially made and recode. Mm. That's how the regression analysis, as I understand, happens on a computer. So it's possible that you could have an AI that could write poems by taking pieces of previous poems and identifying sections of the poem that didn't rhyme and then running a thousand words through a spell checker until it got words that rhymed better. But there's there's no there there, if that makes sense. Like there's no independently existing entity inside the AI that has consciousness, like that likes the poem, that's writing the poem, that's trying to sell the poem. So when you say like the robot's going to take over, the robot's just the thing that's spell checking for you. It's doing so within the parameters (laughs) that you wrote for it, like. Look for words that are better written than Dickens's words, like word better written, 2x, colon, length, colon, size. I mean, it's just a computer coded model. So I don't, maybe I'm just an idiot when it comes to code, although I code a lot of the math I do, but I'm not seeing how that becomes something sapient. And I I think that's the big thing. Like, 
The bigger worry for me would be that people code the machine to become self-replicating and woke, for example, or racist in China. So like you code the machine to like learn exactly from the data and follow the path of the data mm -hmm. and make social adjustments based on the data. So the machine's not alive, but like if you code it to lower the social credit score for everyone identified as racist, and those two groups in the USA happen to be whites and blacks, which they would be, Hispanics would score as pretty and non-racist, then like every white and black guy suddenly can't buy a house. Like AI could do that, but it wouldn't just, it wouldn't independently start shooting members of either group. So you disagree yeah, I, with, um, um, <laughs> you disagree with, uh, Ayala, I think that's her name, right? Ayala, Ella. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think she said what that she gives a 10 years, something like that. I was like, ooh, 10 years. <laughs> well, actually, I know and like Ella. I'm mean, I wouldn't describe her as a friend, but like I actually semi-partied with Ella once. We were at the Quillette event. Uh, and both of us were actually like, I mean, she was just chilling. I was just chilling. Like this was a, an academic thing. No one was really doing anything wild there. But um so, but I mean, like, she's she's cool, she's highly intelligent. But I think that her presets are a little different. She has a real problem with what's called E slash ACC, like the idea of accelerationist uh, mindset in general. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be because of her transition into kind of fast life thought. As I understand, she was kind of a sheltered Christian kid mm -hmm. earlier in life. I don't want to I don't want to really try to pop psychologize someone I'd rather like at all. But I mean, just like, no, nah, I, I think that's bullshit. And the reason I think that's bullshit, there are two reasons. One, we've seen about 60 of these fake doomsday predictions already. People keep forgetting this and they keep starting from point jump and saying, well, like the experts are saying we're all going to die from climate change. The experts are saying we're all going to die from AI. Who are you, you know, cocky business guy um, to, to tell me that's wrong? My starting point would be this has happened many, many times before. Like there's the Club of Rome where the best economists in the world said we were all going to run out of resources by, I think, 1991. There's peak oil. If you follow the fossil fuel markets, peak oil, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, so just like they they kept doing that. There's the um, Western heterosexual AIDS crisis. Where we were all supposed to die of AIDS. I remember in what? high school, in high school, there was a period. Uh, this is going to be way too much information, but I actually stopped going on dates for a little bit. And was sexually nervous enough to briefly be kind of impotent because I was worried about dying of AIDS. Real talk. Like, I went to an urban high school and people were constantly talking about all these diseases. Like, I mean, and this is, I later found out this was fairly common among men. Like, you, they, everyone thought they were going to die. Now, I later, obviously, that faded away, like, totally, you know, you get through that. I love women. I don't think I'm going to die of AIDS. But, but see, that's like, not... that was a big thing. What's up? That's not that crazy though. Like, given what the the climate was about, um, from what I heard from my mom, you know, HIV and AIDS at the time. At first, it was like, oh, this is like a gay thing, and then once it was clear, oh no, this is kind of like in the war, like you know, amongst heterosexuals. I could definitely see how that would be scary. Like, new disease, people are dying. There's no medicine for it. So it was I'm terrifying. Laughing, but... coaches, were, coaches were saying stuff like wear two condoms. I mean, it was like really <laughs> like magic. Magic got AIDS like NBA players yeah. were fucking dying. It was like, I mean, so but no, the, the thing is, of course, it turns out that they're very specific things that spread AIDS, anal sex, which I mean, I'm sure in L.A. at that time was more common than it was in my high school, let's say, um, you know. That is a primary vector. But so the whole Western heterosexual AIDS crisis was, was something very big, though. I mean, if you remember that book, um, The Myth of Heterosexual AIDS that came out, I think that frankly calmed a lot of men down. This was this really affected the dating scene. I'm Casual sex that. dropped 20%. But like moving on from that one, because that one's fun. But I mean, like there are a bunch of these. I mean, global pooling. It wasn't the cover as it sometimes presented, but like page two of Time magazine. The first wave of global warming predictions. I mean, Gore predicted ice cap melting by, I think, 2002. Just on and on. Killer bees in the great northerly migration. The ozone hole would probably be unclosable even when we got rid of uh, CFCs. Just like this has been a really consistent theme. Um, and there, there must be Y2K. Like humans were able to work on that one and fix it. So that did take some human modification. 
But the idea of these doomsday threats, they're coming, they're right around the corner. The, uh, apes on the treadmill, renuclear war, we wouldn't be able to talk our way out of the situation with the Russians. This, is, this has been very consistent for a long time. I don't think that we're going to die now. I mean, if AI really is the risk that it's being pitched as being, I mean, I think we're going to see a delegation of people at Elon's level go behind the scenes to real players like the presidents of France and Singapore and suggest that there be some global action taken on AI. And we'll all of a sudden see the pace of change slow down or we'll see a bill passed with a name like the Not of God's Creation Act that would prohibit certain things. I mean, I don't I don't think we're all going to die like with climate change last sentence. But just like the, the climate, the world is predicted to warm up by, I believe, two degrees over the next 125 years. I couldn't tell you offhand whether that's Fahrenheit or C Celsius. Okay. But I mean, so there's an ocean rise of 12 feet or something like that. I would assume that we're going to build seawalls rather than just standing by the beach and waiting to die. <laughs> I mean, it's just there. There obviously there's a solution there. What did the Low Countries do during the Roman warming period? Like, what did? How did you get Low Countries? How did they drain the ocean? Like, there there obviously are solutions to problems even at scale. So you you kind of fall into that Elon um, bucket of believing that you know human innovation, human. Um, you know, uh, 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 as we continue, you know, discovering, you know, new things in science and technology, that's kind of going to lead us away from all of these, you know, doomsday predictions like it did in the past, you know, oh, there's no more food. And now I think we have more than enough food and, you know, things like that. Well, I mean, you're actually pointing out some that I'd even forgotten. I mean, that was another one of uh, the Green Revolution. Uh, we were all, oh, that's the biggest one, the population bomb, right? Uh, yeah, that's the the new Malthus. That's Paul Ehrlich in, I think, 1972. We were going to overtax the farming capacity of the world. And Ehrlich just ignored two things. One was that birth control had already been in crude form developed by that point. And also, I mean, people can give blowjobs and have anal sex. Like, I don't want to be crude or sarcastic here, but like, we're not we're not just going to keep having kids if we're starving to death. Your, yeah. your wife can say no. I mean, like, it's just there's there obviously are solutions short of death for humankind you know and that Malthus himself was wrong you know when farms started producing at a lower level and that led to some famines people did two things they moved to the cities and they migrated overseas to fight to take new land so there, there's never just been a period where there's been a doomsday prediction made and people have just said okay i guess that's it and then society has collapsed I mean, Jared Diamond does talk about a few regional examples and collapse, but in general, over the 20 big boys in modern Western history, uh, Malthus, uh, Ehrlich, for that matter, the hammer and the dance, re-COVID, apes on a treadmill, we haven't seen anything like that happen at all because either the parameters used in the prediction were wrong, which, which is a methodology I think is very important, or two, people took basic steps. Like, for example, the USA and the Soviets began high-level summit meetings and phone calls, which the political scientists didn't think would happen, to prevent the obvious doomsday risk from taking place. So I, I think the same thing will happen now. Just uh, fucking program the AI to say, <laughs> don't kill people. Like, it's, isn't that the Turing rule or something in science fiction? Just like, yep. say, don't do it. I mean, just the, there's a law where if you don't do that in your programming, the government hangs you. That's it. The problem is solved. OK, this is going to place that I didn't think it was going to go, but I'm I'm interested in this. Uh -huh. So we just discussed, you know, the whole population boom, that, you know, theory that was going around. Now, it, the whole the big talk is population decline. And I can't get a read on how much I should care about this or not. And, and, and I spoke about this on my podcast before where. From what I'm reading and hearing. The freak out of a population decline is really about the economic, uh, you know, situation that we created in various governments. For example, you need a certain, you know, number of Americans in order for you to have social security and welfare and yada, yada. And so I said, well, if there's a population like de decline, wouldn't we just kind of roll back a lot of the, <laughs> you know, all these programs until we can, you know, get to a place where we can afford these pro these programs again, and so it, yeah, it will be stressful and weird for a couple of years, a couple of decades, you know, even. But I don't understand why I should be concerned about the population decline in in and of itself. Like, am I making sense? 
Yeah, no, you're making perfect sense. So first of all, the population decline is what the mainstream center left fought for to avoid the population bomb. <laughs> so, I mean, now you see one of the things with these panickers, like every James Lindsay, a buddy of mine, would phrase this as and nothing is about the individual issue. It's all about the revolution. So, I mean, he thinks that a lot of the people behind this are basically communists or on the right when they're proposing things to do with weaponry or military conflict, they're fascists. And the goal of everything, you notice it's always the same goal. It's getting to the ideal system, which is never our kind of slapdash fun democracy, right? So, I mean, the, when we had too much of a population, well, surely the elites in society who know what they're doing should take over and run this system for the benefit of everyone, now that we have too little of a population, well, surely this is the kind of crisis that requires elite supervision from, you know, so I, I think that many people are noticing these kind of patterns go on. You hear a lot of invocation of Klaus Schwab and other people that exist at the level of global governance. But I mean, so that basic point, though, that the population decline was largely caused by the people who complained about the population bomb, I think goes unnoticed by many. Like the exact things that were discussed, like encourage people through sex education courses to take birth control that were recommended as solutions to the population bomb are the causes of the population decline. Like yeah. the population decline is not that hard to explain. Like peak human fertility is like 22. And it's sort of awkward to talk about this because at the lower end, it starts at like 17 so, I mean, you do get a lot of guys online that are kind of creepy with it, like, hey, hey, hey give me a nice <laughs> young wife, like a caveman, you know, like, okay, bro, calm it down, He's pedophile ass, you're like 39, you know, but like, you know, anyway, not technical, you know, but it's well, weird, the bro, weirdos, it's weird. The weirdos always come out in these conversations. <laughs> they always come yeah. Out. yeah, like, what do you, how'd you even know that? Like, I, I heard that fact from a man that was 41, and I checked it out, it's true, but it's like, where'd you, what made you Google that? But anyway, so. <laughs> But like, okay, so you start here and then you go to like, it's not even 30, like women's advocates will sometimes say that, but it's like, it peaks at like 27. So in reality, most people and men, by the way, like, wait, the wait, wait, just, advocates, just, not to cut you off, just, I want to make sure that um I'm following my audience. So you're saying peak fertility, is this men and women is 17 to 27? Well, for women, it's about 18 to about 28, as I understand Okay. Um. Actually, for for pure teenagers and so on, you are slightly less fertile. There are problems unless you're fully developed. It's hard to have a full size baby. Humans have a big head because we have a big brain. So, like having the the full like passing that out can cause injury. Gotcha. But it's like when you're a young adult, like the when you're when you're varsity, like when you're at the point where you'd be playing for like a college team, is probably when you're at the point when you would start having babies in normal tribal life. Yes. Like you were a young warrior for a year or two. Now, you know, a bigger male warrior has like wed you. You have your your cask of honey wine and you're going to you're going to start having having kids. That's what happened, at least in primitive societies later on. You know, he might apprentice as something for a couple more years. So you move that back a few years. But throughout most of history, prior to, say, 28, 29, within that fertility cusp, people married and they had children. Now, the initial age for marriage in the USA is, I believe, 31 for men and 29 for women. And by the way, like, I'm certainly not a male feminist, but like, because I'm not a creep. But I mean, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not just going to bust on the women here. Like, for the, the same kind of fertility declines do occur for men. Um, now, obviously, we see Al Pacino have kids at 80. It's not the same trajectory, but a lot of it's just about aggression. Like, as a young man, you're very interested in having sex maybe three or four times a day. Uh, to the point where girlfriends and women in general joke about it. Yeah. As an older guy, I mean, you move on to almost the female schedule. Like married couples sleep together two, three times a week. You know, guys have jobs or lawyers or whatever. Um, so you also are not bringing that same intensity to the the pursuit of new life. So men get married at 31. Women get married at 29. Mo both people now have careers. Again, you're, you're having sex twice a week, not always during the, the cycle of ovulation or whatever. I'm not a gynecologist, but I mean, you're going to have fewer kids than if you live together, you're 22, you have sex every day and you're, you're sharing a farmhouse, you know? So right now in almost no Western society is the birth rate, uh, TBR, total birth rate at replacement levels. In the USA, it's at 1.67. And because young people, especially young males tend to die early on for silly reasons, 
you need 2.1 or 2.2 for the population to keep replacing itself. So we know why this is happening at a deep level. It's driven by things that we've been encouraged to do for decades. Um, the feminist migration of women into the workforce, which has been good and bad. Um, the massive use of contraceptives. I don't see why everyone doesn't just accept that that's point one. People can take birth <laughs> control now. You know, that's it. Um, at, at a secondary level, you know, it's it's an age thing. I have a theory. And, I mean, your question doesn't matter is a good question. So here's my here's my theory of what's happening here, right? Because so from what you describe, you know, birth control, um, uh, you know, women going to the like the workforce. I kind of put that under underneath the category of we kind of have cut a lot of accidental births, for, uh, a good chunk of it, right? Now there the, there is some discussion amongst. Um, I was listening to one podcast and they said that uh, when the pill got rolled out, that uh, the number of abortions actually went up, which is I don't know if that's true or not. But it is interesting. But uh, let me stay on my point. Here's my theory. Once you get rid of accidental births, right? Meaning the kids that, you know, come because like you want to have sex and in a world with no contraception, even if you're trying to like, you know, pull out whatever, you're going to have accidents, right? I don't think people realize that for the most part in 2024, we have done such a good job at kicking ass as far as civilization. We have a whole bunch of stuff that we would rather do <laughs> than <laughs> raise children. No one is saying that point. And I think it's the most obvious point that the, the, the birth uh, rate is declining because we have so much stimulus. We, oh, you know, we have, you, you have porn, you have, you know, video games, you know, uh, you, you have, you know, women have careers now, right? You know, the, the fashion, the, all of these things that we didn't have back when we were in these, you know, hunter gatherer societies, whatever. That it's just more appealing than raising a child, especially the early years, because children don't really get fun until like, well, like six, <laughs> six, seven. So that's my theory. No, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, so and this is another thing that people just never actually say, like raising kids is a lot of work. And I mean, I mean the old guy joke is until they get old enough to catch a ball, it's not enjoyable. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Like when I think about my time and kind of the party and sort of sexual play scene almost as a you know younger, fitter guy, I mean, like I would try very hard not to have kids. Like, I mean, we like to the point of talking with girls like, oh, so what are, what are we going to do? You know, you want me to use a condom? Are you on, <laughs> are you on protection? Like, you know, I'm, I go down too. What are you cool with that? Like, it would just be like, you, you have conversations about very specifically, like, how are we not going to have children? Uh, I noticed you already got a couple kids around here and not looking for any more. Like it's, it's to the point where it became kind of ridiculous. Um, and I mean, I think that was because like, if I think about why you'd have those conversations, I was a young executive at the time. I didn't want kids. I now regret kind of not having kids in that period. Mm. Most of the people I was dating were like law students and so on. They all would have been pretty good moms. I very likely would have settled down at the same time. I mean, in terms of like, you know, I'm honestly a famous writer right now. I've written two books. I'm going to drop a third book with uh, HarperCollins, which is a national press in a month. Would I have done any of that? Because I think I would have been a pretty good dad. Like, would I have done any of that at, if I had had a kid at 24? And as a man, it's a little different. Because first of all, like, I mean, you don't want to say something like, you can always adopt an abused cousin. But as a guy, you can definitely adopt, I mean, realistically, through maybe 45, 50. You can honestly have kids through 45, 47 I've still got about a 60% chance of having kids. Uh, for women, it's a little bit different, if we're being honest. But I, I understand specifically why I didn't have children. I didn't want children. I thought they would impede any career trajectory I went on, whether that was in sales, if I wanted to get up to the VP level, whether that was in academia, definitely, where you have to move across the country and your first job's paying you $45,000 a year, um, anything like that. And I, I imagine for women, it's even more serious because you're going to, give birth like you're going to be out of the job market yeah. during your most cutthroat first two years for nine months so yeah that's a that's a big factor one, one was, last thing i will say that the stuff people blame especially when they start blaming the guys like porn and video games i think that has a really small role especially when you control for like use of the phone in general this is one of those things that i kind of ride for online where people are like why are you talking about this go back to talking about like politics and sports or anything else but like Porn has become almost a dark god to, like, internet feminists. Like, people will post things like, boyfriend asked for a threesome. Why is he so porn sick? And it's like, look, 
men liked multiple women long before internet pornography. You can say yes or no, but there is no connection here per like 10,000 studies. So, I mean, like, I will say the amount of porn use guys engage in, you know, it's obviously up from like 1940. But when you think back to the 90s, when like they sold Hustler magazines in every gas station, there were two issues a month and all this, there, there's really not that much of a change. So I don't, I don't think the issue is that men don't want women. You see that a little bit with like the fringe incel community. But the people that aren't having kids are like successful doctors and this kind of thing. So I, I don't really know how much overlap there is there at all. You know what? One thing I want to say, uh, you mentioned, you know, that 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 with men, it's not the, the same timeline because, you know, we can't have children, you know, into our 40s and sometimes 50s. But I will say this, though. One thing that's never discussed is there's kind of the timeline of when you can actually have the kid. But there's the timeline of like raising them. Like, who wants to, like, I'm 30, and I, I think about this all the time. It's like, I'm going to be, if I had a kid right now, and I, I'm not, but if I had a kid, like, right now, got, got some girl pregnant, right, I'll be, like, 31 when the kid is born. I'll be, like, what, 46 during the teenage years? <laughs> right? It's like, you know, people don't think about the, yeah, the energy that you, that you need to have during those years to be like active and, and like, I remember playing ball with my dad, you know, in, in, in the park and how, you know, he didn't really have, the, cause I have older parents and he didn't really have the energy that, you know, probably his dad would have had who had him in his like twenties. So that's, that's something that I think dudes need to remember. Um, one thing I, I wanted to ask you though, or, 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 maybe ask, but also comment, you brought up the porn thing, uh, which got me thinking about Matt, Matt Walsh. And I'm forgetting her name. It's a, a a a a famous feminist who I love. She's from Canada. Um, Megan Murphy. Megan, maybe Megan Murphy. Yeah, Megan Murphy, the redheaded Me one. Yes, 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 yeah. yeah. There's a Christian right feminist left alliance sure. a, a, a against porn right now. Um, there are multiple states passing these ID laws, which is really just embarrass you enough to not uh, jerk off. And, and, and <laughs> I'm gonna say something here where it's like the war on porn to me is kind of misplaced, like you said earlier, because these desires have kind of always been around in human beings. Thus, porn was like born, you know. Now, do I think that you know things kind of get extreme and yeah, totally, but those natural desires were there. I remember when there was this big discussion going on about like choking, right? You know, and who was kind of responsible for, you know, choking being introduced into the bedroom and people were saying porn. I think it was you that that, that brought up the fact that, that, you know, when we talk to guys, a good chunk of these dudes will say, like, it, it was introduced to them by the girl. Oh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> so I don't get yeah. this, this war on porn. So actually, I wrote down a couple stats here because like one of the people I've dated in my life um, was is someone who researched a lot of actual sexology. And like there's a whole field of actual sexology, like Deborah So, another uh, acquaintance to casual friend is a sexologist. She wrote a great book about sex and gender. So we have the data on actual human sexual fantasies and all this going back to like My Secret Garden by the pseudonymous Nancy Friday in like the 70s. I'm not going to count Kenzie here because that dude was like a weird rapist. But I mean, there, there's a whole literature on this stuff. So I mean, like, first of all, porn is not some novel phenomenon created by crazy sick men in the past 30 years. I mean, erotica is about 10,000 years old. It's made up a similar proportion of human art the entire time. Uh, it's been about equally graphic most of that time. Like the Kama Sutra shows anal sex, light bondage, all the stuff we do now. Um, you know, Romans and most civilized people, like ancient Romans, were a hell of a lot kinkier than we were now. They had slaves, oh, yeah. they had orgies, naked gladiators with 10 inch dicks would walk around. I mean, there's like the uh, the stereotype of Americans actually is we're actually considered pretty good lovers because we're, you know, we're big and we're puff but we're not globally if you party we're not considered to be sexual libertines we're considered to be kind of prudes Prudes, yeah and i actually think that and everyone who's been to europe or africa knows this to the point where it's kind of a joke uh, that jamaican similarly like just watch jamaican daggering at a party like nobody is sex is a part of life 
Americans are not the most sexual people on the planet. The reason we have this insane reaction to regular, like, happy wife gives blowjob pornography is that that is a big part of our culture. That's where the Christian right comes from. And what a lot of feminists won't admit is that that's where a lot of feminism comes from, too. Mm. There's a strong what's called battle axe tradition in feminism. Lips that touch liquor will never touch mine, so on down the line. Uh, comes out of prohibitionism, comes out of women-dominated semi-church spaces like Unitarianism. So that is the, the ground level of the anti-pornography movement. It's not a backlash in a libertine society to evil. It's a very old prudish tradition that you can respect or disagree with. And I mean, my problem with like the anti-pornography movement is that a lot of the stuff they say is complete bullshit. <laughs> So like there's a common, but like uh, I, I'm a stats guy, like there's a common claim that like 88% of porn includes violence. If you look at that, what's counted as violence is stuff like hair pulling, ass slapping, like light choking. It's just sex, like slapping your girl on the ass or pulling her hair. If she asks you to is not abuse. Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks it is like some weird preacher wrote that down. If you told your wife this, she would laugh at you. There's a one of those studies includes ingesting semen as like abuse. <laughs> That's swallowing. That's what most girls do when they give blowjobs. Like, I mean, we're talking about an adult topic here, but like yeah. you can't just define any sex but the missionary position as violence mm -hmm. and then say that pornography is violence. Like anal sex is another thing that's regularly counted as violence. This is all just like marriage on the weekends. Like it's not, th these are not serious abusive things. Like I would even question whether consensual BDSM is at all abusive, but that at least, that's an argument you can make. But so, I mean, when you see this, you're looking at the ass slapping, hair pulling, light slapping, choking, coming on each other, anything like that would be, would be put in that category. And again, it, it's really worth noting and any experienced man, probably including both of us knows this, Women tend to be freakier with guys they like than men are. Men sex every man knows this. Men's sexual fantasies are like faces and positions. Like, yes. hey, get on top this time. Can you bring a friend? I mean, like that sort <laughs> yeah. of stuff. Three, some, you know, yeah. like women's fantasies, and I'm, I'm making fun of the men a little bit, presenting us as kind of brutes, but like women's fantasies, if you ever read a series of women's romance novels, you'll be genuinely surprised and a bit shocked, boys. Like, I mean, there's an entire series of orc porn that's out right now on Amazon. And every one of these books has sold more than 500,000 copies. Yep. And it's literally women being raped by goblets. It's like the idea of being ravished by these powerful beings from another warrior species that don't have to control themselves in a situation where you don't have to feel guilty. That That's obviously the framework there. So like when, and by the way, about 60% of women have, I don't know if I would call them rape, but what are called CNC, consensual non-consent fantasies about extremely rough sex mm -hmm. guys in general and this is up to each couple i i don't have a moral judgment here but often have some issues acting these out along the lines of i'm not trying to see the police this yep. is not a thing that i like <laughs> to do so th this whole thing of like these brutal men are trying to watch these dirty movies and then hold us down and choke us no, these movies are filmed by female actresses for $10,000 a scene, and 60% of the time, it's you guys initiating rough sex. Like, I'm not trying to make this a male-female thing, it's just those are actual facts that mm -hmm. are very often relevant. So, I mean, I'm not actually a huge fan of pornography, but this whole idea of, like, men are forcing this onto women, women never watch it, 55% of women watch porn, by the way. This is, it's worse than it's ever been. That is just pretty much made up. So you can say as a wife, like, I don't want you watching a large amount of pornography. I want to satisfy you personally. But this is where we're in a married couple. But the sheer dishonesty of a lot of stuff on the hard right and the hard left really irritates me. And this this is a good example of some of that that dishonest material. Yeah. Um, a lot of men were confused during the whole Fifty Shades of Grey Era. I remember that era. Confused at all. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> bro. Do what they wanted. I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm making fun of it, but like, you know what? No guy who's had more serious girlfriend was confused. A lot of women want to be tied up by rich guys. Like, come on. Well, look, maybe because I was young, because because I think I might have been in high school when that came out. No, no, college. Okay. College. Like, but early college. I might have been a freshman, maybe sophomore, I think. Um, and so 
It was. I was like, you know, hey, I didn't get the the, the big hoopla. I, I went to see the movie, and I was like, oh, this this is a lot. You know, this this Christian Grey dude, he, he's kind of you know hardcore. Um, but yeah, uh, to your point, I think a lot of people are being dishonest when they have the point of conversation. Um, but like, what is like? So, what is driving the anti-porn movement now? Because these these critiques have always been been like, there's always been an anti-porn um, movement amongst the the, the feminist movement. We know there's been an anti-porn movement among, amongst, you know, um, like uh, Judeo-Christians in America. But like what's causing all of these laws, you know, these these porn ID laws now? And they always frame it as protecting the kids, which is why I say a lot of the times, you know, I kind of hate the way kids can be used in politics because everyone turns oh, yeah. their like we turn our brains off. But so like, do, do you have, is there anything that, that, that you notice about why is it happening now? Like, why is it starting now? This the serious push where laws are actually passing out. Well, I mean, so I think that the the evangelical feminist uh, alliance isn't as odd as it might sound because at root, they basically want the same things in a lot of arenas. So I, I think most people recognize that men and women are different. I mean, women are six verbal IQ points smarter and men are twice as strong and so on, but the great strengths on either side. But they're basically equal, and they should have pretty much equal rights in most situations. There's not a there's not a major EQ difference in most cases between men and women or something like that. But I think that evangelical Christians and feminists, rad fems, do think there are radical differences between men and women, and they favor dramatic restructuring of social codes to reflect that. And I, that's something I, I haven't really prepared my my breakdown of that right now, so I'm not going to get into it. But I mean, so like both of them do favor extreme restriction of dating, for example. Um, so like any allegation of sexual violence by either party should be taken incredibly seriously. So like, you know, if someone had sex drunk and not, the first line of that, obviously, like to some extent, yes, of course, you should take rape charges seriously. But the idea that if someone had sex while intoxicated, they can credibly claim to be raped if their partner was also intoxicated and they consented. I think that's something that almost all feminists and a surprising number of evangelicals, but not a lot of mainstream citizens would agree with, if that makes sense. No, yeah. Because the idea is that men and women should not be in that situation. Um, there's an idea of kind of protected courting. The and Actually, I don't know. I might be, might be kind of rambling about some of this. But... The idea is that men and women are quite different. They need to be protected from one another. Um, sex has kind of a dirty element. Um, the The idea might be they might differ in terms of who needs to be protected from who. So in the Christian tradition, the idea has always been kind of Jezebel and Delilah, right? Like men are solid warriors and whores distract them. They pull them away from their wives or from the battlefield. So you want to confine sex to the arena of domestic marriage where a man is probably dominant most of the time and that's it. And you don't want too much temptation for the guy. And you certainly don't want to tip the wife away from her husband and Lord. For the feminists, it's kind of the reverse. Like they'll, they'll usually have sex, often in surprisingly kinky ways, with guys they like. But they think overall men dominate women and harm women and heterosexual sex probably isn't ideal. Many feminist friends of mine have said they wish they were lesbians. <laughs> um, depictions of sex hurt women because it makes men think women are sexual partners or whatever. It, the whole objects, thing's kind of hard objects, for me to process. Yeah. But the two of which is a meaningless term. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but but the two the two groups tend to agree. They differ on who's getting hurt, but they tend to agree that just looking at sex is bad. And they tend to agree on a lot of other things like this, like just casual dating is very risky. Hoarding is a good idea. Men and women have very, very, very different strengths and so on down the line. Uh, but anyway, so the, the anti-porn alliance has, has been the case between the two of them for a while. Why are they just now agreeing on uh, site-specific laws? I, don't know. I mean, I, one reason is that there's a lot of internet porn now. Um, another reason is that you have a conservative Supreme Court that might uphold them. Yeah, oh, so I mean, you're I, saying I like, that's... like it, it's like the opportunity is is uh in our favor. Let's strike now while we have this window open, kind of thing. Yeah, you strike while the iron is hot. I mean, that's probably a big part of it because part of the porn debate is whether this is free speech, 
And to some extent, it sounds kind of silly, like how is screwing someone in the ass speech? But there actually are a lot of very eloquent porn cases that say, I mean, like one of them looks at the erotic book that I think is called Flowers, which is a series of pictures of vaginas and says, well, this obviously is presentable as art. I mean, another one of them looks at the uh, classic movie, what is it, Deep Throat, and says, I mean, this actually is one of the funnier movies that came out that year. You, there's no way you can ban this, really. So, I mean, like, porn actually has about as many First Amendment protections as most other forms of speech do. And you can dislike that, but I don't really see why porn would be less protected than, say, gangster rap or you know, sociopathic heavy metal stars shrieking about the devil or, you know. <laughs> Yeah. draft king sports book waste your money now you know like any of the other stuff that's out there so See, i'm i'm pro uh, let me phrase this carefully i'm pro porn existing right i don't yeah, think it's, it's 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 speech though like that that argument was always confusing to me uh like the speech is, speech is, is is like spoken word written word in my mind right and, and I, I know, and I know that. Um, oh, I'm right here. I'm just there's an oh, issue with my. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So for me, um, speech is like spoken word, written word. Um, and yes, we have we have you have pornographic images in books. You have pornographic, you know, uh, uh, pictures. And so in that respect, cool. That's kind of maybe falls under the speech. I do think today, though, the porn that we have now. The like you know Pornhub and uh, you know all of these you know other sites like I don't think I view that as speech, but again it should exist and like I, I want it to to exist. I'm against censorship almost almost completely. So this is not me saying porn should go away, but it, like the, the the whole porn and speech argument. And really, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I just want porn off of Twitter or, or X. I hate it. Well, I don't really so. I actually think that the porn is speech argument isn't really all that weak. I mean, like if you have a video called Swallow Queen Makes Me Happy with Mouth, and it's a I mean, like so again, one of the things that's interesting, the feminist argument against porn actually strikes me as pretty weak, by the way. Like we spend a lot of time talking about porn for some reason. But like I actually know a pretty good number of sex workers, like in real life, like former grad students that I went to school with and so on. And, you know, you also, you know, they're only fans, girls that debate on my page and so on. And the actual trafficking rate for sex workers is like half of 1% or something like that. Certainly for English speaking Americans. Like the reality is that the majority of people who make porn are either people who make like a G a week and who would rather give two blowjobs to do that than clean toilets at a Taco Bell. I mean, that's an actual line I heard from one of them. One. Or two, they're amateurs that are basically making this content with their wife or a few boyfriends or girlfriends. So, like, most of it really is that. Like, it's, like, a guy who gets hid from three different women who are really good at it. I mean, and again, like, this is, you know, from casual watching a year ago. I'm not, like, staring at my phone every day, like, I don't look at it. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know... But it's like, that's what it is. It's like a blonde, a redhead, and a brunette. And it's this guy just uploading videos. Everyone's consenting. There's a blue... And porn, porn sites have, like, blue checks now. You know, like, I there's an ID upload process required after the one trafficking lawsuit for the creators. After the one... Tra well, good. We're not going to start uploading porn. I mean, it's like, you know... You no, gotta... no, I, that was crazy to me. Like, when, when, no, but the, when, the, the, no, I'm saying, like, to use that case, right? Because, again... Pornhub gets how many up like uploads per day, right? Of course, well, million. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So of course, a subset of that is going to be like victims, right? Like just just off of like the the, the numbers, you know, yes. somebody who was you know recording their girlfriend didn't ask for permission, put it up, or a girl that was trafficked. Cool, I got you. Take the video down. Them using that to kind of as the 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 springboard for all of this like anti porn stuff. I thought that was insane. But the thing is, though, like, this is one of the points. Like, they actually did it, though. Like, all of the OnlyFans sex workers, a lot of whom are feminists, were like, okay, we'll do that. So, like, this is what I'm saying. The feminist argument here is actually incredibly weak. Like, the argument is, like, you're watching televised rape. But no, you're not. Like, if you click on a standard video on Pornhub, it's a guy and his girlfriend who are good in bed going down on each other. 
and there's a check mark showing that they've uploaded their fucking papers to the site because you guys have hassled the site so much that they now have to do that and they have to pay taxes on this shit. So, I mean, like the idea, like there's no way you can confirm this. Yes, there is actually. I mean, so again, and like, I guess the final line about this, like if someone was really from a feminist or Christian perspective going to say, well, there's no way you absolutely know that any pornography or any similar content like this was made without hurting people. I think it was Ella who said this, actually. The response would just be, well, okay, what if I just watch like triple X hentai, like Japanese cartoons of people fucking and killing each other? Would that mm. be cool? And like, there, but I mean, there's, there's not one trad person alive that would say like, yes, watching extreme sexual and different context violent like asian content is awesome because the yeah. actual objection isn't to the theoretical idea that someone could somehow get hurt it's to the idea that sex is dirty or anything that presents women as freaks is dirty or something like that and that's where the christians and the feminists come together and if you're just a regular guy who's been in sexually satisfying relationships and has heard women and men express what they're interested in, you probably don't take that all that seriously, I think. And that's that's where kind of the moderate position on the issue comes from. I actually don't have a problem protecting kids. Like, the ID thing is funny. You know, get a VPN. But, I mean, you see where it comes from. Like, you, there are young users of the sites. Yeah, I just don't like it because I feel like they're going to use my information, my information for something. I don't trust none of these people. I know, like, what you, you think I'm, 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 you know, you upload your your ID to Pornhub, and you know, it just goes nowhere. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's the obvious. Well, that's the obvious reason. I mean, so like, people keep asking like these stupid questions, like, "Well, what are you afraid of? Are you a pedophile or something?" It's <laughs> like, no, bro. Like, I'm I am worried that on the odd occasions when I might check out this site. If I give all of my information to a sketchy pornographer, <laughs> they might sell it to someone that would do something with it. So, I mean, like, clearly there, there's a practical reason that people have for not wanting to do this. Again, I mean, my personal opinion, there are a lot of intermediate steps. Like, you could just put the three intro pages that say, like, are you over 18? Are you sure? What's your name? Something like that to scare kids away. I mean, some gambling sites do that. There are many things you could do other than requesting IDs. My personal opinion, though, is that because VPNs exist, this is going to have very little impact. Uh, so why now? Probably because the courts will allow it. Probably just because there are a number of big sites. You know, probably because they were successful in making the creators do all this. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm not sure. You're not going to get pornography off the Internet. And again, if you were successful in doing that, all that would happen is that there would again be large scale in-person stores selling porn in your community. So, like, the basic human taste for sexuality is not going to go anywhere. I, I don't know if people remember that in Chicago, like, they're the Times Square. Like, in every big city, there used to be, like, 10 or 12 of these. Oh, no, like, yeah. New York City was bad. Outside. I mean, so I'm not, I don't see what the inherent logic is that it's worse that you can do this anonymously on the Internet. But, I mean, I, I'm sure the debate will continue. Well, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, All right. <laughs> so I guess is there a way uh for somebody like me? Because here's here's what I struggle with, right? We kind of talked a lot to you know a lot of numbers today and 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 you know things that don't necessarily match up to kind of certain narratives on social media, certain narratives that you might read, you know, in certain places. One thing that I struggle with, and I, I say this all the time, I struggle knowing like how to look into things, right? Like um, data, studies. I feel like I could find one study that says something on one topic and I could find another one that says something the exact opposite on the same subject. And no one kind of teaches, you know, you as as the, the, the citizen, how to like sort through data, how to, you know, get to the truth. So, like, as someone who specializes in this, if you had to kind of give, t you know, give tips to somebody who is not, you know, as knowledgeable as you on, you know, how can they look at information, at stories and kind of get to, like, the truth, you know, what would your uh, tips be for, like, an average citizen? 
Well, I think one of my most basic tips would be when you're looking at studies, you're right that there seem to be a lot of contradictory studies, but there's a very specific reason for that. The question to ask is, what did they adjust for? So, I mean, like in many, many cases, there are, the question of what you find depends on kind of the level of analysis that you stop at, if that makes sense. So, like, let's look at police shootings. If you look at police shootings at what's called the first level of analysis, just raw numbers, raw numbers would be a good way to look at this. You'll find that more white people, particularly poor whites, get shot by cops. So in a typical year, there are about a thousand or eleven hundred people shot by cops. Well over 500 of them are just white. They're Caucasian guys. Uh, they're not even Hispanic guys. Uh, 250 of them are black guys. Now, if you take that to the second level of analysis, which is called, uh, bi I sometimes say univariate because it makes more sense, but it's called a bivariate regression analysis. You could sometimes do a version of this as a t-test analysis. Um, you're going to see that black people are proportionately more likely to be shot by cops and that black people make up only 13% of the country, but we make up about 25% of those shot by cops. So we're 250 out of 1,000 now. So we're about twice as likely as you'd expect. Now, the third level of analysis is multivariate regression analysis, or if you want to go over time, time series analysis, something like this. Now, there are more sophisticated, you might be able to do something Bayesian with this. There are more sophisticated versions of analysis. I would normally stop at level three. But if you put in other things in what's called the model, like, for example, the crime rate for African-Americans and whites, you, uh, you see something crazy, which is that the black and white uh, rates of police shooting come to, they come to what's they, there there's a null point there there's no statistically significant difference between the black and white rates so you've got twice the per capita rate of blacks being shot but 2.2 times the per capita rate of violent crime for black people so you find no difference there's you mm. know a p value as we call it of like 0.89 so when a study finds something that stands out and then another study finds the exact opposite the thing to know is just that they're looking at different things. So if I just look at raw numbers, I find that white people are more likely to be shot. This is what a lot of kind of alt guys online find. Just like, hey, remember that we're the majority, Tony Tempo. Then if I just look at, if I, not just, but if I go to the next level and I look at per capita, this is Washington Post, this is where journalists usually go. Most journalistic analyses are good, but univariate. Um, I'm going to find that black people are more likely to be shot. If I actually do the full scholastic analysis, I'm going to find that there's no difference between the races at all. So that's Roland Fryer at Harvard. So, I mean, I guess what I would say is when you look through these studies, I mean, you're clearly at the level where you could read the methods section, something like that, to see what they took into account. Uh, in general, a study that involves race and that finds... Actually, I think this is a point that's so broad, I will say it. A study that finds racism or sexism is generally worthless if they don't take other very important things like social class into account. Okay. So like I recently saw that a study that uh, claimed to have found one of the ways that people claim to find racism, there are actually two things that are worth talking about here. Two of the ways, I guess. Two of the ways people claim to find racism. One is look at whether black people are more likely to be stopped during the day than at night. Uh, and supposedly that's that's evidence that racism is an operation if they are more likely to be stopped during the day, because at night it's harder to see if someone's black. And I guess what I would say there is you need some kind of social class adjustment, like make of the car. I'm not really an expert on this kind of research, but like at night, you also wouldn't be able to see the quality of the car, the number of people in the car, mm -hmm. you know, whether the tags were expired, any of that kind of thing. So you can't assume racism unless you adjust for the class proxy. Like, I didn't say that especially well, but it's it's really obvious. Uh, another thing would be, and this I do know at an expert level, what are called list experiments. So a list experiment is a situation where you send in, say, 2,000 resumes to different employers that have stereotypical black names on one half and white names on the other half. And if you find a difference in callback rate, and people often do, it's usually about 7%, between the black names and the white names, you might say, well, I found racism. But the problem with that is that the black names and the white names are also going to vary in social class. Like stereotypical black names are obviously a lot more working class, let's say, mm -hmm. than stereotypical white names. Like a stereotypical white name is like... Steve. Bri or what's up? Steve. Yeah, Steve. Steve could be used, but it would be even more than that. It would be like Bree Joy. 
<laughs> Whereas a stereotypical black name would be like Jamarian. So like they're not entirely hood, but like people are probably more likely to hire Bree than Jamarian to host the front desk at a restaurant. <laughs> like yeah. I, I might be myself. I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to look at the resumes. So the way to do that would be to adjust uh, two guys named Deroli and Kodal actually did a really good version of this where they gave people last names that were just obviously minority. Like they got some bullshit about this, but there's really, to me, no doubt about the names. They're like Hernandez, Black Fellow, like, I mean, this type of thing. And then they gave them just standard first names like John, Marcus, Chloe. Mm -hmm. And they had those people apply for jobs. And there was no difference between like the upper middle class minorities and the upper middle class whites. So I guess look for what's adjusted for, look at whether class proxies, things like that, region, IQ, whether that was thrown into the mix. And if it was, and if racism is still found, then yeah, they found racism, which still sometimes happens. That IQ point that you dropped at the end is so fascinating to me um, <laughs> because there's been a lot of talk, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, jobs and discrimination and, you know, all that in college. And I, you know, I look around sometimes, I live in New York City, and so many of these jobs require for you to have a, a college degree. And I'm like, I don't think you need a degree to do this job. And is it true that that they made IQ, like employers can't, can't administer IQ tests for applicants? Yeah, that's a famous case called Griggs v. Duke Power, if I have the case correct. Um, yeah, so in general in the United States, there there's a crazy sweep of civil rights rules that go well beyond, like, you can't fire someone just for being Black or female. Like, in general, you can't do anything that disproportionately, that produces disproportionate results among, like, whites, Blacks, Hispanics, and Natives. And the problem is that that's everything. Sometimes the directionality reverses, so it's like Hispanics over Blacks or something, but I mean, or Asians over whites. But I mean, so yeah, like IQ tests were found to have a disproportionate effect for like this powerful regional power company in that fewer Black people were getting hired than you'd expect down there in whatever, somewhere in the South. And so IQ tests were thrown out as a proxy pretty much everywhere in the country. And I actually think, and I'm not alone in this, that this is the thing that made college so valuable and that yeah. really boosted the college hustle. Because normally in the past, you could just give like a smart working class kid an IQ test. And if he got like 110 or above, you'd say, okay, you're hired, you're on the sales floor. But if you can't do that because you'd immediately have the sales floor shut down for racism, then you have to use that proxy. And that proxy is you went to a four-year university. And that's one of the reasons people have all this debt to do jobs like working on trading floors that you don't really need a college degree to do in any way, shape, or form. Like, it's wild. And, um, but people don't want to hear these arguments though, because, you know, IQ tests are racist. Many people believe that just in and of itself because of the, 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 you know, different results. But I think, man, look, man, when you, when you try to solve certain problems in a stupid fashion, like, getting rid of the IQ test, now you add, oh, we all need college degrees, which, of course, by the by everyone getting a college degree, lessens the value of the college degree to begin with, and you're stuck in this cycle of people who don't need college degrees for certain jobs, they got to get them to get jobs that don't really pay that well, and then people who before, um, because there's this dude on Twitter, I think his name was like I slash O monitoring, something like that, and he talked about the fact that, you know, the IQ of the, of the average college grad, like, went down by, like, five points from you know, 20, 30 years ago. And I'm like, what, what, like, what are we doing? So now, I mean, that guy, I, I like some of his posts, but also spends a, an, an inordinate amount of time talking about like black, white IQ gaps and so on. But like, yeah, the, that, that point of his is, is well-researched and is correct. Like the IQ of a college graduate used to be around say 120. It's now about 104. And the reason for that is that about 70% of both white and black men go to college. So you have to ask yourself, like, do 70% of people need to go to college? And the answer is clearly no. No, no I mean, the, the, a 70th, a 30th percentile job is like shift supervisor at a Wendy's. So no, you don't, you don't need a degree from Duke or for that matter, a regional school to do that. So yeah, we're, we're putting a lot of people in kind of hustle situations they don't really need to be in, in my opinion. Well, thank you again for coming on to the podcast. Uh, you mentioned the book coming up. 
and what next month yeah the book is called lies my liberal teacher told me it breaks down a lot of the nonsense going on in the schools right now more from the left than the right by this point historically and yeah that you can find out all about that on amazon that's going to be released june the 11th june 11th okay uh i definitely will be reading that book um like i said you i call you uh, you know the, the numbers guy because i feel like you know following you on twitter has helped me kind of suss through a lot of this gunk in the water. <laughs> so again, everyone should follow, you know, Will, I'm going to have your information, you know, in the show notes. Uh, good, thank you once again, as you know, to the audience, please make sure you uh, subscribe, rate and review the podcast. Uh, tell two friends about the show and I will see you guys in a week's time. Deuces.